0 to 9 of the square root of 2t dt. So the way you can think of that is it's 0 to 9 of 2t to the 1 half dt. So how do you do this? You have to integrate that. So what power do you have to have? What power? You know it's going to be t over 2 to the 3 over 2, correct? Right? But there's you need but when you drop the 3 over 2 to the front, there is no 3 over 2 sitting in this one. So what do you need to put out front to take care of the 3 over 2? You have to put a 2 thirds there, correct? So if you thought that this was the integral that you were looking for, if you took the derivative of this, you should get the square root of 2t. There's a problem though. What is it? You drop the 3 over 2, what does it cancel with? 2 thirds. And then the, what does the power become? It becomes 1 half, correct? But, but, what, but the chain rule will kick out a what? A 2. So what do you have to park out front to get rid of that 2? 1 half. So here is your true integral right there. Here is your true integral right there. So what does this come out? What does the integral come out to be? It comes out to be 1 third 2t to the 3 halves plus c is your integral. Correct. But why can you do that? Because you can. Where did the 1 half come from? The 1 half came from the fact that when you do the chain rule on this, if you do the chain rule on that, you drop the 3 halves to the front, and what does it cancel with? The 2 thirds. It's gone, right? Right. The power gets decreased by 1, so what does it become? A half, right? But because of the chain rule, what gets kicked out of here? The derivative of the inside is 2, right? Is there a 2 floating outside here? No. no. So what do you put out front to take care of that 2? A half. The 2 thirds neutralizes the 3 halves. The 1 half neutralizes the 2 that you're kicking out right here. Okay. We're going to learn more about this in the form of u substitution in a little bit. But this is about as hard as you're going to get without using u substitution. So you do this, and what's nice about the number we're plugging in? We're plugging in 0 to 9, right? So what can you do here? Do you, do you have to worry about that c value? No. no, because it's c minus c. It's gone. So you end up with 1 third times uh, 18 to the 3 halves, something like that. Is that correct? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh, something like that. Uh, square, so what do you end up with? One, well, it's 18 that minus 0, correct? Yeah, something like that. Uh, so what do you have here? The uh, You have the square root of 18 to the what power? To the third. How do you break up the square root of 18? It's 3 root what? So it's 1 third times 3 root 2 to the what power? To the third. So what does that become? 1 third 27 times what? Root 2 times root 2 times root 2, correct? I'm just simplifying here. So what does that become? 9 times 4. Oh, interesting, interesting. So you guys thought it was 36, didn't you? Or someone no, said it was 2 root 2. Oh, it's not 4, it's 2. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. So it's 18 root 2. There you go. That's where it comes from. Distribute. Yes, please distribute. So what do you end up with? The integral from 0 to 1 of x to the what power first? Cube root is what power? One third plus one is four thirds plus x to the five fourths dx. And now you're just integrating each of these. You know that the power increases by one, correct? So it's x to the seven thirds and x to the what? Nine fourths. But you don't have your coefficients here. What are the coefficients of each of the terms with x in them? What's the co? It's one. If you took the derivative here, you would not be left with ones as coefficients. You have to neutralize the powers that you are dropping down. You drop down to 7 thirds, so what do you have to park out front? 3 sevenths and 4 ninths. And you're doing this from 0 to 1, the nicest region possible. You plug in 1, and what do you get? 3 sevenths plus 4 ninths. And what's that equal to? 55 over 63. That's where it comes from. 30, all you do to set 30 up, Julia? is you turn it into the integral from 1 to 9 of what? 3x over root x minus 2 over root x. And then it simplifies, and then it's just a straightforward integration. So now it's 1 to 9 of what? 3 times x to the 1 half minus 2 times x to the negative 1 half, and this is all dx. Can you integrate that? I, that then you integrate that and in just undo the power rule. All we did right here, what, what, what is this called? All we did was simplify.
or depending on your perspective, we just rewrote that. We changed it into something that is much more easily integrable. Do you see what we did there? We just broke up the fractions. Mm -hmm. So again, don't forget you can simplify. Yeah, 1 plus cosine squared is what? Is it? No. It's not. <laughs> this is where it gets a little... <laughs> what is 1 plus cosine You're tempted to do what? You're tempted to say 1 plus cosine squared is sine squared. Is it? Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, right? So 1 minus it is that. Uh, that's true. Yeah. So there's a slight problem here. Oh, man. How about we just do exactly what we just did? What does it turn into? What's 1 over cosine squared? So secant squared d theta plus 0 to pi over 4 of 1 d theta. The derivative of what is secant squared? Tangent. So this right here is just tangent theta from 0 to pi over 4 plus theta from 0 to pi over 4. So this can, well, it's easy because we're, we're doing the proper methodology. There's a million different routes you can take, especially inside trig. How many different ways can you attack a trig problem? Many, many ways, and they're not all going to be correct. So yes, once you see the proper path, it makes sense, and I'm glad it makes sense, but just because the path is easy doesn't mean that seeing the path is easy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of the coolest math proofs I've ever seen in my entire life studying math are seven lines long. They're really short, but it took them, the mathematician 10 years to see those seven steps. I'm not kidding. Some of the, some of the most eloquent things are the hardest to figure out. So then what's tangent of pi over 4? Yeah, it's just 1 minus 0 plus this. So it's 1 plus pi over 4. Secant squared theta. And what happens? It's gone. So what do you end up with? 0 to pi over 3 of sine theta d theta. Yeah. And can you do that? I don't know. You just have to remember. Now, how do you remember some of the basic trig identities? This is what I do in my head all the time. You ready? This is what I remember. I remember this. Sine squared, cosine squared is equal to? One. one. You have two different paths from that. That's the first one. The two different paths. Divide by cosine squared. You end up with one plus sine squared over cosine squared equals one over cosine squared, which is one plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared, right? The other path is dividing by sine squared. And then you get cotangent squared theta plus one is equal to cosecant squared theta. So you have two paths. Just remember this and remember how you get there, and it takes you about 30, you know, less than 30 seconds to get one and two, the other two Pythagorean identities. A random guess. I'm going to substitute now. I'm going to take these. I'm going to take u, and it's going to become the integral of the square root of what? What is that? That is u. And instead of dx, what am I going to write? du over 2. What can I pull out to the front? 1 half times the square root of u du. What is the integral of the square root of u? What is the integral of the square root of u? u to the what? Yeah, 2 thirds u to the what? 3 halves plus c. But what does u equal? What does u equal? So what does this equal? The 2's cancel, you end up with 1 third times 2x plus 1 to the 3 halves plus c. Substituting in for a specific value allows you to keep track of some of the consequences of the chain rule. It's OK if that totally didn't make sense right now. Let's do another one and see if it clicks a little better. What do you think u is going to equal in this second example? 1 minus 4x squared. So let's try it. u is going to equal 1 minus 4x squared. Uh, Camille. What is du going to be equal to? Ah, uh, uh, what? Uh, the de negative, negative dx. Wait, what? Oh, right. Kicks out the dx. What is dx going to be equal to, Julia? Yeah, du over negative 8x. And now what do we do after we do that little uh, oh. simplification or isolation? We substitute. It's now going to be the integral of x over what? The square root of u. Instead of dx, what do I write? du over what? Negative 8x. The first of a couple magical things happens right about now. 
you're going to be conditioned, hopefully, to feel very good when this happens. What am I able to do right now? You see the X's right here? What happens to them? They're gone. That's awesome. If X didn't go away, we would have X's and U's mixed together. Is that a good thing to have? No. You don't know how to integrate that. You, that's a wall. You're stuck. If you pick the wrong U value, that's frequently what happens. If you pick the wrong U value, you end up with U's and X's, and that makes you sad. Okay? So what do you end up with? Negative 1 eighth, the integral of U to the what power? Negative 1 half du. Can you integrate that? I, you can. What power is u going to be raised to? To the 1 half, but what do we need to park out front now? 2 plus c. What is u equal to? 1 minus 4x squared. So what do you end up with? Negative 1 eighth times 2, 1 minus 4x squared to the what power? 1 half. And you can put the plus c on the outside. That's totally fine. You don't have to put it right there. Plus c. So what does it simplify to? Negative 1 fourth, 1 minus 4x squared to the 1 half plus c. Now, how would you check to see if that works? How would you check your answer? We just found an integral, so how would we find our, how would we check our answer? Take the derivative. So let's take the derivative. What do we have to drop to the front? The 1 half. So what do we end up with? Let's check. We end up with negative 1 fourth times 1 half times 1 minus 4x squared all raised to the what power? Negative 1 half. And then what do we kick out? Because we have to use the chain rule. Negative what? Negative 8x, correct? You see what's going to happen here? What does the negative 8 cancel with? Both of those, right? And what are you left with? x over the square root of 1 minus 4x squared. Did that check? It sure did. What was the magical step at the beginning, though, Hunter? What's the magical thing that started us off with this method? The u. There were going to be three levels of u substitution problems. There were going to be ones where they say, it's u substitution, and here's the u. The second level is going to be, please use u substitution on this, but we're not going to tell you what u should be. And what's the third level? They'll just say, do this integral. It's not that bad. It seems random now, but as you do this more and more often, you will recognize when u substitution can be used. Is u substitution something that is always going to be the appropriate method of integration? No. But you will get good at looking at, oh man, I think this is, oh, I think I'll do it here. For example, what was the commonality between these two structures here? That there's a radical, right? You're integrating something with a radical. That's a really good sign you're going to use u substitution. Someone asked me last block, Ask, uh, why, did, why is it u substitution? Why isn't it like q substitution or r substitution? You know what my answer to that is? No idea. I think they just started calling it u substitution, so it stayed that way. It's kind of like the x and y axes. Why is it called the x and y axes? Seriously. Someone started it off that way, and it just kept on going as far as I know. <laughs> There's no deep answer. You want a deep answer. If you do this out, and you make that u substitution, what is du equal? Cosine theta d theta. So what does d theta equal? Du over cosine theta. So you end up with e to the what? e to the u times cosine theta. And then you have du over cosine theta. What's the happy thing that happens right now? Yeah, those, what happens to them? They're gone. So you're left with the integral of e to the u du, which is equal to what? e to the u plus c. And what does u equal? So the final answer here is e to the sine theta plus c. That's it. Uh, we do the integral, inter, uh, the integration, and you end up with 1 half times what? Uh, 2 thirds u to the, to the what? Anybody, yeah, 3 halves from what to what? Yeah, you say go from low to high, from 1 to 9. From one, no, it's totally fine. From 1 to 9. And what's nice about this is you can plug 9 and 1 both into 3 halves powers. You can actually, can you factor this out? Y you can. So what does it become? 1 third u to the 3 halves from 1 to 9. So what is this? 1 third times what? 9 to the 3 halves minus 1 to the 3 halves. 
What's the square root of 9? What's 3 squared? What's 3 cubed? So it's 27 minus 1. So what's the answer? 26 over 3. Go ahead. No, no. Did we have to substitute back in for x or for u? Meaning, did we have to get x back in there? No. We did not have to because we changed the limits of integration. If you really wanted to, could you go back to x? Sure. But if you go back to x, you're not plugging in 1 and 9. What are you plugging in? 0 and 4. Exactly. So now we take the x. goes right to the outside. So it just goes 1 third, the integral of the square root of u du. And what's that going to be? 1 third of 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. So you end up with 2 over 9 u to the 3 halves. But what does u equal? Because you know that this is 1 half power right there. 1 half add 1, what do you get? 3 halves. You have to drop that to the front, but it, there is no 3 halves out front, so what do you have to cancel it with? 2 thirds. So what do we end up with? 2 ninths times x cubed plus 1 to the 3 halves plus c. There it is. How would you check that quickly? Just, no, you would take the derivative. Yeah. 